Hi everyone. Again, we're going to find it helpful to go over some of these exercises from Michelle Berdine's text uh, live in a kind of uh, context where we're just able to work through and see what's happening in each situation. So I figure you're going to do a great job working from the Greek into the English, but it can be a little bit trickier moving from English into Greek. Uh, even professionally trained classicists have a hard time translating on the fly English into Greek. They're much better at doing the other, which we practice more. Uh, but learning to go both directions uh, in the translation process is really the way to solidify your knowledge and show that at every point you have the solid understanding uh, that's going to help you in further chapters. So we're going to take some time and actually do these exercises uh, because they're one of the most important parts of learning Greek. Even though we're all in Greek, not to write new Greek poems, but probably to read Homer, to read the Bible, whatever. So let's do this. Exercise 20, page 22. We were not hindering the soldiers is what we're doing. So let's pause and break this sentence up. We is going to tell us about our subject. It's first person plural. We're not hindering. This is going to, in essence, be our verb, right? Um, it's going to be past tense. It's going to be progressive in aspect, so it's imperfect. It's an imperfect verb. And then the soldiers, in this sense, we have the subject, verb, direct object. This is the English order. So we have a direct object, and this will be in the accusative because the verb hinder takes an accusative uh, because it's, it's a material verb. It, it has real-world physical application. So let's start with the verb, and then we'll get to the direct object later. So hinder, what verb does this come from? And then there's no way to logically know this. You just have to have memorized your vocab and be able to say, oh yes, hinder is kaluo, I hinder. Well, good, but we need to put this in the past tense. So we'll remember to put on our past indicative augment, the unaspirated epsilon. And then we need to make this first person plural, we. Uh, so we do that by adding the thematic ending, amen. So this is two syllables, both short, sends the accent back onto the antepenal. So this is perfect. That accent can maintain, uh, can remain up on top of the upsilon. So echo lu amen, we were hindering. So how are we going to get this not <laughs> in there? Well, rem we remember that this is an adverb that does this, and it's ooh. And it normally precedes the verb that follows it. But also remember this proclitic adverb, ooh, when it's followed by an unaspirated vowel, like, like echo luomen, uh, becomes kappa. And were this um, aspirated, uh, like ukhaireo, say, we'll, we'll get to that verb later, that's an aspirated diphthong, we would have to make that into a chai, uh, basically out of liaison. Uh, the kappa here doesn't doesn't need to pair with anything, but here we have, in essence, an H sound, and the K and the H combined to create the K. All right, but that's neither here nor there. That's not what we're talking about right now. We were not hindering. Perfect. And now we can get to the soldiers. So, soldier, let's see, what was that? So we have a number of forms. And I haven't used this one in our lesson so far, but stratiotes with that accent on that omega. Sorry, that's a nasty looking omega. Stratiotes and then stratio tu and then ha. It's masculine, so nominative, genitive, masculine um, it is our word. So we need to make it it's going to be masculine, so we can tell the article right now is going to be masculine accusative plural, tus. Uh, I can give that grave accent because I know we have another word following. But then let's let's work through that stratio uh, What will that be? Uh, so the the stem of the word won't really change stratiot. Uh, but then we remember for masculine nouns, the first declension will have ace, u, a. Ain. In this case, this is type A. We remember that we could also have as, u, a, and an, uh, and cl class B, and that would be like 
Neonios, young man. But, all right, there we go. So that's our singular mas uh, masculine first declension in the nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative. If we move over to the plural now, uh, nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative, uh, we have in both cases, I, own, and then always with that circumflex, ice, and then as. So that's going to be our form here that we needed accusative, plural, direct object. So we can get rid of our chart and just add in that long alpha sigma. That's a long alpha. This is a, the accent tended to fall on this omega, the penult, and because this is long, it's important to know whether this is long or not because it'll affect accent. This will be acute. Were this a short alpha, this would be a circumflex, but it's not. So we, we, were, it's kind of a combination of this personal ending in this past tense, not hindering the soldiers. So you can see how the understanding of this, this order that we have in English does not reflect at all the Greek order, uh, but everything is there. Every part that we need to, to, to express in sentence one, we have here in the Greek. So let's do sentence two now. Let's get a different color, shake this up. The young men, so this is going to be again our nominative subject, um, and it's plural, were marching, so again, imperfect tense, that's the name of this chapter, and then towards Athens. So remember this uh, was a preposition, ace, proclitic, no accent, but a smooth breathing, and then this takes the accusative. So we will need the plural accusative of Athens because city names in Greek, not always, but often were plural. So just like this S kind of seems to suggest a plural in English, Athens is really almost means Athena's, multiple Athena's. Uh, so good, this is our breakdown, let's get started. So the young men in the nominative subject, and we just kind of went over this, it's the class B of uh, masculine first declension nouns. So again, it is masculine. So we have a masculine article, the young man, hoi neonii, were marching. So what was the verb for march again? This is stratello, right? That's the first principal part. That's what we're going to use to build, but we got to drop the personal ending and drop the accent because that might change. Now we need to make it past tense past indicative augment right there, and then young men, third person plural, so we need to make this on, stratoon. Short, skips over the diphthong, accent on the alpha. The young men were marching, and then as we had, es, toward, and then when we're gonna have Athens. So capital alpha, smooth breathing to the left of the capital, um, theta, long eta for this e, and then in the nominative form, we'd have Athenai, but that's not, or sorry, I with a, uh, a little Romanism or Latinism of me there. That's the nominative form, but we don't want that. We want the accusative plural. So that's going to be just like stratiotas up there. So a long alpha, and then again, because the accent naturally is on this eta, we're just going to have that. So this is good to, for us to know, but you won't see that in the text. We'll see the young men were marching toward Athens, plural Athenas. Speaking of Athena, let's go to number three. Will Athena stop the battle? So we've got two things. We've got a question, and then this is future tense. These are new, but then otherwise, subject Athena, stop, verb, and then the battle. So direct object with a definite pronoun, or de definite article, rather. So will Athena stop the battle? So let's pretend that we have already mentioned Athena in this context, so we will want to put that article before her name. So uh, nominative, he Athene, Athena, will she stop the battle? Uh, so let's make this a question. How do we do that? Well, the answer is we'll have this, uh, what looks like a semicolon at the end of the sentence. That's all you need to do in Greek. Um, here we have to do a word order change. If this was a statement, we'd say, Athena will stop the battle. To make it a question, we foreground this auxiliary verb, will. Will Athena stop the battle? Greek could rearrange the sentence structure, but it wasn't necessary. They'll take care of it with this 
punctuation mark at the end, which really just reflects an inf um, a way of speaking. Uh, they would raise, just like we do at the end of a sentence, stop the battle, question mark. Um, here they would have, hey, Athena, blah, 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 stop the battle. Exactly. So we're going to fill this in now. Will stop is all that we need. So we have powo is the verb, but then we need to make this into the future. So we actually need to know our second principal part, which for this is easy. It's just a, an extra sigma. So pauso is I will stop. But now we need to make this third person singular for Athena. So, pause. So, hey, Athena, pause. Now let's make some extra space. The battle. So, the, well, what is battle? It's mache. But then we need to make this accusative. So, how do we do this? This is a class one or class A type of feminine noun. So, we can know it's tain and then makain. Accent stays the same. So here we have it. Athena, the Athena. Sh she will stop the battle. Question mark. <laughs> so we could also rearrange this. We could put pause first. We, I mean, we could put tain makain. When you have questions in Greek, it's the first word that tends to be the question. So in Greek, hey Athena, pause te makain. This would be asking is it Athena who will be stopping the battle? Not, not so much will this st stop happen, but will Athena stop the battle? If we wanted to put pause first, pause, hey Athena, te make, the question would be, will that stop happen? We know that there's a battle, we know that Athena's there, but we'd want to know what's happening. So Greek tends to foreground what's being questioned to the very beginning of the sentence. But that's advanced Greek stuff right there. We don't need to quite get into that right now. Let's move on down and take these last, uh, well there are ten exercises in Shelmerdine, but we're only going to do uh, the first five here. So the sailor flees to his house. Subject. Flees is the verb. To his house. This is again going to be a, a prepositional phrase like toward Athens that we had, which will be ace plus the accusative. Great, so the, the sailor. It's going to be masculine, but first declension. Uh, we only know first declension at this point, but uh, we'll have to ultimately train ourselves to know this ending can be masculine. Ho nautes, the sailor flees. And what, the, what is the verb for flee? It's felgo in first person. I am fleeing. Uh, but this isn't I am fleeing, it's he, she, it flees. So we make this a third person singular. Feoge. The sailor is fleeing, flees to his house. All right, so ace is easy. And then what's the word for house? It's oikia. But we need to make this an accusative. So here we just add a new at the end. But then we need to say his house. Well, we haven't learned how to do personal possessive pronouns yet, his. Uh, but we do remember that in Greek, the definite article can be used when the context is clear to mean what in English we would need to express with a personal pronoun. So in English, we couldn't say the sailor flees to the house. Well, we could, but if it were his house, we'd want to specify that. Greek feels no need. They're happy to say the sailor flees to the house. Understood that this is his house. Good. So that was not too bad. Let's do this again. The sailor, again subject, was not trusting, so imperfect verb, and it's negative, so we're going to need a oo or ook in there somewhere. And then Xerxes, who's going to be quote-unquote our direct object, but remember what verbs of trusting do. We'll get there just now. So let's uh, shake it up again with another color. The sailor, so ha, nautes, we're good at that was not trusting. So we can put a oo in there first, and then remember that trust was pistelo. I am trusting is what that means. So we need to drop the accent, drop the personal ending, get to the, the stem, and now make it past tense by adding the indicative augment, and then make it third person singular. So for this, we add an epsilon and potentially a new. That's movable. Either way, the accent will be the same. This is short, so it skips over 
the diphthong all the way back to the antipenal at pistoe or an. What else am I missing now? Well, we were fine when it was u pistewo, but now that we've made this past tense and have this vowel, this past indicative augment, we're going to need to make this a kappa. That's a kind of movable sort of idea where we, we ooh, eh, this two vowels into each other, Greeks didn't like, they'd like to separate this. Uh, so we have ho, nautes, ouk, epistoen, and then Xerxes. So again, imagining that we have mentioned Xerxes before, we're going to want that definite article. And we want it in the dative, masculine dative singular, that's what we have here. Masculine because Xerxes is masculine, uh, despite what you might have seen in that movie 300. Uh, very masculine in Greek, although, well, complicated, but let's just work with the masculine thing for now. Uh, so masculine dative, why dative? Because remember, pistewo means to believe, trust, but also to trust, what we might say, trust in. And this is calling for a dative. So now we need the dative form of Xerxes. Again, he, in the, the nominative, is one of these A-class nominative masculine first declensions, Xerxes. So, so we're, forget the accent for right now, we'll get down to the ending, and remember that this type A went ace, u, a, and then ain, and then kept on going in the plural, but you won't have plural with Xerxes. Uh, only one Xerxes, uh, and indeed Xerxes will be the dative form. Accent can remain here, that doesn't change. So here we have our dative object. It's not really a direct object, but it, it's, it works like that. It's working with the verb epistoe, uh, believe, and then we can see now that we don't need this new movable because this next word, the, the definite article, begins with a tau. So, Ha nautes uk epistoe to xerxe. All right, well, that took about 17 minutes, so hopefully you'll be able to do um, exercises 6 through 10 in about the same amount of time, maybe 20, 25. Uh, but let's look back again at what we did. So most of the exercises in this chapter, chapter 4, are dealing with the imperfect tense, but not all of them. So remember that we're going to be wanting to add these past indicative augments and use these characteristic imperfect endings. What were those again? So normally in the present we had O, ace, present and the future actually, A, and then Amen, Ete, and Usi, with a movable new. So that's pres and future. For our imperfect now, let me do a little cleanup. Remember, things got a little bit different. We had on, s, a eh, with a movable new, then amen, et, eh, that was the same, and then again, on. So paying attention to both the past indicative augment and the endings, and then also noting the way that different prepositions will work with different cases. Ace takes the accusative, and then noting also that the definite article can sometimes be used as a possessive pronoun, his in Greek, effectively. And then that some of these verbs, like trusting and ruling, take a direct object, quote unquote, that's not in the accusative. Uh, pistewe with, uh, or pistewo with a dative, and then basileo with a genitive. All right, that should do it for now. See you next time.